Cathedral of Hope, we come to worship the God who greets us every day of our lives. We come to praise the God of our past, present, and future, to marvel at the miracles of creation and new beginnings in our world, and to make ourselves ready, ready to welcome God's Holy Spirit into our hearts. So rise, church, in body and spirit, for this is the day our God has made.
everyone on this holy day. Be with us now. Remind us, God, that we are in your presence. Open our minds, our spirits, our very hearts to receive the goodness of our God in the name of the one who creates us, redeems us, and sustains us. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, grace and peace to you in the name of the risen Christ. Good morning, Cathedral of Hope, United Church of Christ. What a joy to welcome you to worship this morning as we gather in this sacred space and acknowledging the sacredness of each and every one of us. And as we bring our whole selves into this place, God is present. Welcome to each and every one of you as we gather on this beautiful day. We want to welcome you. If this is your first time, um, you are our guest as always. And if you would like to help us out by giving us some information um, in the front of your pew or in um, the chair area, there's a connect card. Please fill out what you feel comfortable. You bring it to the connect center. We have some wonderful people that want to connect you, to want to make you feel like you're, this is your home. This is a place for you. And then we have a gift for you. What do we do, everyone? job. I love it. Uh, one of these days we'll get ourselves on QVC. Who knows? <laughs> My dream. <laughs> we also want to extend a very special welcome to all those who will be worshiping with us online. We're so grateful for your presence amongst us this morning. Please know that we are thinking of you and praying for you wherever you are in our world. Cathedral of Hope broadcasts to more than 70 countries each and every time that we open our doors, and we're grateful for your presence as we gather this morning. Uh, please do let us know that you've been present and also let us know if there's a way in which we can be praying for you or celebrating things that are happening in your lives. And also let us know what you're doing in your corner of the world to make the good news of Christ come alive. Cathedral of Hope, please join me in welcoming all those we're worshiping online. Once again, we want to thank our Chancel Flower Ministry for beautiful flowers. Um, they are given today in honor of Glory of God by Ken Chow, Phil Hirsch, in memory of Dr. Jerry Green, and in honor of his surviving spouse, uh, Tom Dang. It is a beautiful story, and they just wanted to share it with us. We're always grateful for the ways in which we can share community life together, and uh, flowers are just a wonderful way of being able to do that. Want to uh, we'll welcome a little bit, a bit later in our service our very special guest, but uh, as we come to worship this morning, would you please join me in welcoming the Reverend Dr. Yvette Flunder, or as I prefer, Bishop Flunder. Hashtag Sunday Funday. You really are in for a treat this yes. morning. And uh, as we welcome uh, Bishop Flunder, we also want to uh, welcome especially uh, Bishop Alex Bird and uh, Reverend Marvin Roberts from Living Covenant, and also uh, Dr. Will Gaffney, who is the professor of Hebrew scripture at Bright Divinity School. We are so grateful for your presence with us this morning. This week, we want to remind you of our Pulse Worship Pick Me Up. It's a midweek Wednesday night worship service. We are going through the book of Philippians. We are ending it this week with our brand new series, focused a little different than Sundays, but still helping you enter the new year right. So join us this Wednesday at 7.15 at Pulse. And if you are so inclined to be evangelistic this week, yes, we are reclaiming the word evangelism. Yes, we are. Yes, Amen? We are. Amen. On Tuesday, we have a taste of hope where we um, create the most amazing meal and bring it into the community with people who have food insecurities, people who are homeless. And so we want you to be a part of that beautiful ministry. More information is on page nine. It's called A Taste of Hope. And if you turn with me to page 12 of your weekly, you will see a couple of announcements there. First of all, about our Super Bowl of Caring, uh, which will happen on Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, we, uh, as a church, uh, find ways in which we always want to reach out into the community and make a difference in other people's lives. And on Super Bowl Sunday, our youth will be out in the uh, narthex, uh, banging saucepans and doing all the things that youth people do. Uh, but they'll be asking you to bring in your change, uh, which we will put into those uh, Super Bowls. And then all of the money that's collected on that day uh, will go to our uh, youth shelter and to our transitional housing for LGBT youth. Uh, so please do become prepared on Super Bowl Sunday uh, to make a difference in other people's lives. It's what we do here at Cathedral of Hope. We find opportunities to celebrate together, to connect our lives together, to commit to the good news of Christ and to claim what that means and how it has transformed us. And it's in that claiming of the good news that we then proclaim it in the world. And so as we gather this morning, we celebrate the goodness of our God. Let's rise in body and spirit. Let's greet one another in peace.
Oh, there we go. I don't need it that loud. Uh, this is normal. Is our the last Sunday of the month where we have our time with children, and we do it every month because you all look forward to it. I know. I've already seen some happy wavens to family, all excited to be up here. Um, it is very exciting, and we love it when you come up here. Um, I wanted to show you something. Mm, okay, what is this? Ooh. Uh, <laughs> Could I love you all anymore? It really couldn't happen. Um, does anyone know what this is? What is it? Anyone know what this is? What is it, Jude? A tape. Anyone know what kind of tape it is? What is it, do we think? I think it's a movie tape. It's a movie tape? We used to call it VHS. VHS. Ooh. Who remembers going to the video store and getting a VHS? <laughs> Raise your hand in here if you've seen a movie on a VHS tape before. Probably not. Maybe some of you. Oh, okay. Good. So this is, like you said, a movie. This is, tells a story, right? And, and nowadays, how are some other ways that you watch videos or hear, see stories, visual stories? How do you see them? In the movie theater? Yes. On TV, yes, we can just plug and hit the, the, the buy and we can get a movie. What about you, Rachel? On your phone. On your phone. That's the best answer, right? That's the best answer. I know who watches movies on their phone. Jude. A movie disc. On, on what? A movie disc. On movie disc. So there are movie discs as well. We got DVDs eventually. But when I was your age, what about you, Scotty? Um, to turn it on is a the remote phone. and a so sometimes we have these smart remotes, huh? Yeah. Where they I, do stuff. Yeah, I have a long one. You have a long remote? Yeah. Well, I, I'm, we're glad to hear that. That is good well, news. Then, so glad. Than, than my mom and dad and my mom wow. And dad. Yeah, that's good. That's good. We're going to record that story and we're going to put it on the VHS tape. You're so cute. I love you. Uh, so I wanted to remind you all that even though the way we hear stories may change, right, uh, it's still the same story encased in it, right? And I know that some of you have had to move recently. We are getting a, a Hope Day School. You're excited about that, right? So we've had a lot of construction in your normal area. And so you've had to move to a different venue to hear the story. You've had to move to a different location there's different ways you're hearing the story. And I wanted to just say, on behalf of all of us, thank you for how gracious you are being. You are sharing your space with us. You are giving your space, uh, you're claiming the new space. You're claiming the story. And it may look different, right? Where you are may look different. And eventually you're going to get to go to the new place. How many are excited to see what's happening in your new location? Are you excited about all the stuff that's going to happen? But right now, you are being so kind and so gracious and having so much fun in that area. So we are so glad that you are here. Is there anyone that is excited about something in the new space? What do you think? What do we think? Oh, Luke, what are you excited about? No? <laughs> do you want to give your time up? There you go. What are you going to be excited about, do you think? What are you excited about newness? Candy? Okay, good. Excited about newness? Um, it's just going to be bigger. It's going to be bigger. We're going to have some bigger space. It's going to be awesome. What about you, Scotty? Um, 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 lollipops. Lollipops. Yes, in the new place, we may or may not have lollipops. I don't know. And I'm glad that you are all so excited. And so just like sometimes when we have old things that have served us well, we have to go into new things, which share the same story, share the same sacredness, but look a little different. So I'm glad that you are all so wonderful, flexible with us, and we're going we're gonna to pray, and we're going to end this time, and I'm going to send you off. I know you all want to chit-chat, but we got to get going. <laughs> let's pray. Let's pray. God, we are grateful that no matter what 
It looks like where the sacred space is, God, you are there in the midst. Whether it's big or small, whether it's new or old, God, you are always moving and speaking your story through us and through the sacredness that we share together. So may you continue to share the beautiful story of your love with all of God's people. And they all said, amen.
lesson is from the eighth chapter of the book of Nehemiah. Hear these words. All the people gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe Ezra to bring the book of the law of Moses, which God has given to Israel. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both women and men and all who could hear with understanding. This was on the first day of the seventh month. Ezra read from it, facing the square before the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. And then Ezra blessed God the Most High, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. And then they bowed their heads and worshipped God with their faces to the ground. And so they read from the book, from the law of God with interpretation. They gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Most High God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine, and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our God. And do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. May God bless the hearing of these ancient words. Amen. God be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, o God. Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and his reputation spread throughout the region. He began to teach in the Galilean synagogues and was praised by everyone. Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. Entering the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his habit, Jesus stood up to read. When the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of God is upon me, because the Most High has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of God's favor. And Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. 
The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the gospel of hope. seated. You can read a lot more about our guest preacher this morning on page seven of your weekly or just by Googling or Wikipedia her name and you will find out so much about her. For those of you who are regulars here at Cathedral of Hope, you know that on a Sunday morning it is very rare for me to yield the pulpit and still be in the building. But the truth of the matter is there is no one to whom I would wish to yield this pulpit to more than Bishop Yvette Flunder. Yvette and I have known each other for many years, and in the time that we have known each other, we have worked together on many projects. We've worked on being a spiritual voice in what is often a wilderness. Her and I, and when we were in California specifically, worked tirelessly on Proposition 8 and helping both the LGBT community and the religious community to understand what it means when we use the word family, to create new families and to affirm all families. We have been exciting to journey together, and when I first asked Bishop if she would come and preach at Cathedral, her quick and resounding answer was yes. And two years later, I found myself on her calendar. <laughs> Friends, I know that you are in for a treat this morning. So buckle up, sit back, don't get too comfortable because there is an uncomfortable, inconvenient word that is about to hit us this morning. Please join me in welcoming our bishop, Bishop Yvette Flunder. God bless. And so I'm going to take a bit of liberty in as much as this is the rowdier of the two services <laughs> that happen here at the cathedral. And I've also asked my colleagues and in so many ways sons in the gospel work about their opinion. Uh, Bishop Bird and, and Pastor Marvin, could I sing a little bit today? And so they said, go ahead. Yes, so, so there's just a, a verse and a chorus of a song that's in my spirit, and I want to share it with you because this is a tenuous time still for a lot of our folks that have been disadvantaged by not having paychecks for the last two pay periods. Uh, many of the workers will get their money. The contractors will not. They will not get their money. And there are some folks who have had to leave their jobs because they had to do something else in order to feed their families. And there was a song that came up in my spirit, and just the chorus of it, this, this is the song. It says, God gives more grace as your burden 
things grow greater and God sends more strength as your labors increase and to add it affliction God adds mercy and to multiplied trial God adds multiplied peace and when we have exhausted hallelujah our own store of endurance. Have you ever felt like your strength was about to fail and your task is just begun? And when we have depleted our own heart, Resources. That's when God's full giving is only begun. Oh, God's love, God's love has no limit. Hallelujah. And God's grace has no measure and God's power has no boundaries known oh, unto man for out of out of God's infinite And then keeps on giving, my God giveth. And then keeps on giving, I like that part. My God giveth. And then God giveth. Oh. for the journey. And my grandmother used to say, I trust in God, I won't take nothing for my journey. I know what she meant, because these are complicated times. And I'm learning to lean. A hymn writer said on Jesus, and I'm finding more power than I've ever dreamed, just learning to lean on Jesus. And Jesus stood up to read in the synagogue. They had in their synagogues usually seven readers during his time. Every Sabbath, the first a priest, the second a Levite, and the other five Israelites, always men, in the synagogue, read. We often find Christ preaching in other synagogues but never reading, apart from this passage, except in his home synagogue, in Nazareth. Jesus had a home synagogue in Nazareth, which he had been aligned with, we suspect, for many years. He'd been a member. Jesus was a Palestinian Jew. 
He was never a Christian. <laughs> and he was a Palestinian Jew in good standing. He offered his Sabbath service as he had perhaps often done. He didn't seem to have been a stranger. And he read one of the lessons out of the prophets from the book of Isaiah, which was likely delivered to him on a scroll, either by the ruler of the synagogue or by the minister. And they went to Isaiah 61 and 1, and they didn't have them numbered like we do, you know. He had to read from the scroll. It was likely pointed out so that he would be in the correct order, reading from the right place on that day. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Spirit has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. The Spirit of the Lord sent me to proclaim release to the captives and the covering of recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those that are oppressed. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And then he closed the book or rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And this was the peculiar thing. And all the eyes of those in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And then he said to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Essentially, before today, we read from the book. But today, the announcement I want to make to you is I am the book. I am called not just to read it, but to be it. Jesus had just returned from John's baptism and Satan's temptation, been in the wilderness where the devil, where Satan, where the evil one tempted him to abuse his power and to use his influence to his own gain. He was now attending his home synagogue in the ghetto, <laughs> Nazareth. They said nothing good comes out of Nazareth. He's kind of like on the other side of the tracks, the way people think of Southside Chicago. <laughs> Nazareth. And he stood and he read from the scroll, the scroll, again, the Spirit is upon me. How do I know that the Spirit is upon me? Because the evidence of the Spirit being upon me is the Spirit has called me to give good tidings to the poor. And let me make an aside here, because this suggests that where there are not good tidings for the poor, there is no presence of God's Spirit. When he read it and rolled it up, gave it to the minister, sat down, and their eyes were still fixed on him, they knew something different had occurred, something more than the oft-repeated words of Isaiah. I suspect that they, like us, could feel something was going on. There was some shift in the atmosphere. Because they'd heard Isaiah's words read over and over and over again. But Jesus was suggesting that he had a new way to read history, not just to read from the book, but to become the book. The promise is now fulfilled in his entrance upon public ministry. Now, the report that they heard of his preaching and miracles in other places had turned into the now. Anybody understand that? You've heard from other people what God can do, but it gets real different when it visits you and you begin to have an experience. Jesus said, now, I know you've heard about this and that, but now, in this place, in this synagogue, in this preaching, in this now moment, I'm about to let you know what God is about to do now. We're not talking in the past tense about what God has done. We're talking about what God is doing in your sight now. 
Isaiah said in Isaiah 29 and 1, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to take the book and open the seals, for he can open not the book only, but the understanding. Hallelujah. I tell you, because I've had this experience, when Jesus spoke of paradise in the conversation, this sort of idea and vision of a coming time, a paradise, an experience of jubilee. He was suggesting to them that the jubilee is sitting here in this synagogue with you today. Paradise, this peculiar reality where the lion lays down with the lamb, first of all, is not typical. And as we say often, and it's said to our community, it ain't natural. For a lion to lay down with a lamb. The reason it is supernatural is the lion and the lamb must simultaneously surrender some part of how they are perceived to be in the world. The lion must give up its tendency to be a predator, but the lamb must give up its tendency to be prey. When the lion lay down with the lamb, it's a miracle. When paradise really comes from the heart of God into the earth, when jubilee really begins to really be evidenced in the earth, a miracle is taking place. Jesus was suggesting it's kicking off right here today. And I want to say something to you, Cathedral. It's kicking off right here in this room today. 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 This is paradise. We claim it to be so, not in the future, but in the place where the Spirit is. Jesus set the tone for the role of the church in the earth. Consider the text. He read from the book, he gave it back, he said, I am the book. Let me say it again. He read from the book, he gave it back, sat down and said, I am the book. I'm gonna say it again till you get it. He read from the book, he gave it back, sat down, said, I am the book. And perhaps like Jesus, some of us need to put the text down for a minute <laughs> and understand that the intention of God is that we would become the book. Why do I say that? Because I was the champion. I got the ribbon all the time for being in the Bible drill at our church. I could quote all the books of the Bible backwards and forwards. And that was quite an achievement coming along in the church. And I used to call them the ayahs, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all of them. I could quote them all backwards and forwards. It didn't mean that I understood them, but I could quote them. And I know a lot of people that quote and don't understand the essence of the heart and purpose of God. They got the book down. In fact, they have learned it so well until whatever it is they don't want you to do or be, they can go find some scripture for it. Am I right about that? Am I right about that? Yeah. And there's something in there to help them. <laughs> and it all depends on your hermeneutic. I thought about it this morning. It all depends on your hermeneutic. If you have a, a hermeneutic of slavery, I, there's something in there for you. If you got a hermeneutic to hate women, there's something in there for you. If you got a hermeneutic against gay people, you can find you something. If you got a hermeneutic against whatever you got a hermeneutic against, how am I doing with that? There's something in there. It depends on the way you go to the book. That's why the book doesn't have a right essentially to speak the heart of God in all things because first you must find the heart of God. Then you can go back to the text and know when God wrote it and when somebody else did it in God's name. Yeah. The word of God. What does it mean, the word of God? Jesus said, you're looking at it. If I was in a Pentecostal church, I'd tell you, turn to your neighbor. <laughs> tell your neighbor, you're looking at the word of God. There are words about God. Come on now. 
Theos Logos. There are words about God. Hallelujah. But the word of God, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. What is the word? God. What do we have the opportunity to embody? The word of God manifested in us and through us. I come from a people that knew God who were functionally illiterate. <laughs> but they knew God. And you could tell them something and say, well, God wants you to this and God wants you to that. They said, no, God doesn't. Yes, God does. No, God doesn't. How do you know? Because I know God. Something very powerful. Consider the text then. Jesus says, I am the book. It is more important to be the book than to quote the book. What happened that day was likely similar to what happens among us. When Jesus made this declaration, some people got excited and said, isn't this Joe the carpenter's son? We hear he's become a wonder out in the suburbs. <laughs> <laughs> and he's back home in the synagogue right here, our synagogue. So come here, Jesus, heal my camel. <laughs> come here, Jesus. I'm having some trouble with the tax collectors, the IRS of their day. Come here, Jesus. Set us free from this Roman Empire. Take back David's throne. Restore us to power. Do some miracles and stuff. Because we've heard that you can. Jesus said, I, the reason I came out of the wilderness, the Spirit of the Lord was upon me to give good tidings to the poor. My purpose is to be the fleshly representation of God's intention for humanity in the earth. That is our task. That is the role of the church. That is what we are responsible to do. Somebody said, take back David's throne, if you're really all that, Jesus. But the truth is, when we are lifted and lofty, it is because we are bringing good tidings to the poor. I can hear Jesus responding to the church world today. See, this is why I cannot do what I'm sent to do. Because you all want to know the book, but you don't want to know me. You all want to have fine and good and powerful looking stuff with no substance and no power. You're struggling about things that do not matter. You've been politicized and captivated. You've become elitist and indifferent. Not here, certainly not here. But there are a few people in a few places for whom this is the word. <laughs> like how to achieve greatness at other people's expense. Like developing church is competitive big business. Worrying about maintaining status and reputation. Fear that being prophetic and speaking truth will cost at the offering table. Worried more about looking good than doing justice. I'm preaching now. I know what I'm preaching. Self-imposed convenient theological ignorance. Self-imposed convenient theological ignorance really troubling people who go through seminary and they know and they know but they won't tell the people what they know because if the people know what they know then that keeps the clergy from being elitist does anybody understand self-imposed convenient scientific ignorance when you know better come on now and you know better and you learn better and you know better but you keep defaulting to what really are the things that people want to hear hear me now self-imposed convenient scientific and oppressive religions that demonize and vilify all that came before them particularly ones that have historically targeted indigenous people and indigenous faith as though our ancestors my Igbo ancestors and my Cherokee ancestors and my Celtic ancestors were not people of God God by any name is still God. Amen. Hallelujah. Still God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. God is still God. And so Jesus read the book. 
And then Jesus gave it back and sat down and said, I am the book. Put the book down for a minute and realize what it is for. Hallelujah. And understand that God, if God wants to, can do a new thing. Anybody got that? Somebody said to me once, said, well, you and Shirley, Shirley and I have been together 34 years. They said, you all can't be in the will of God. You can't be in the will of God because the Bible says, says stop for a minute. Shirley and I aren't in the Bible. <laughs> we don't have a, an example of two women that loved one another for 34 years and made a life God married. Do you understand what I'm saying? Raised some children and, a, and one of them is a bishop and the other one's a gospel music artist. Anybody understand what I'm saying? We don't have an example for that. But that's okay. I'm here. And I exist. I'm impossible, but I'm possible. The truth of the matter is a whole lot of things. The internet's not in the Bible, but we believe in the internet. We believe in it. Some of us would drop dead if you took Facebook and Instagram and Snapchat. Come on. Twitter, we would drop dead today. This would be our last breathing day on earth if we didn't have it. But the people who say that they don't believe in me already have a preconceived pejorative assumption of how God feels about me. And I need to say to you, my beloved, God can do whatever God wants to do. The greatest mistake humankind ever made was to try to fix God into a book. They put a back cover. We should never have put a back cover on the book because God is still speaking fresh word from God. And so I'm not here to talk about church's big business. I'm here to let you know that I appreciate everything God is doing through us and for us as long as we remember that we are called to be the book. How you are is much more than what you've read and quote. And sometimes when I'm teaching preaching in the schools, I ask my students, now preach what it is that you believe and don't quote not one verse from the text. No scripture, no line, no, don't go and grab anybody. Tell us what you know based on your walk and can you find a word from inside of you the way that you quote what writers said that they understood about God. Essentially, what is God saying to you? And how is God requiring you to conduct your life in the earth? Breathe in the word of God, Theos Logos. Breathe in, because in the beginning, it was the word. Don't get stuck on the book and get disconnected from the word. Oh, you need to hear me, beloved. Don't get stuck on churchology and get disconnected from spirit. Don't get stuck on how your blood family will not receive you and forget God's got a family for you. Don't get stuck on the ridiculousness of our government and forget that God is still large and in charge. Does anybody understand? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> so how about this Jesus of the book? Who is this Jesus? And what would this Jesus have us do? Well, Jesus did some stuff during his time that was counterculture. He broke with things. He met that woman at the well. Come on now. <laughs> and she was not typically in her custom to be traveling alone. Come on. An odd hour at night, a single man, single woman, you know the people talked. <laughs> met the woman at the well. What did Jesus do with the woman who had an issue of blood? Come on. What did Jesus do with the man at the pool at Bethsaida? What did Jesus do with Mary in the living room? while Martha was in the kitchen 
And a woman's role was not to recline with the men to talk about the things of God. It was to fry chicken. But Jesus <laughs> broke with tradition and made the woman welcome and told her sister, leave her alone. She has chosen the better part. His diverse following, the impact of their presence, it had an impact on his reputation because the, the people said Jesus hangs out with people who drink and people who eat too much. And you never read anywhere where Jesus turned and said, no, I don't, I don't, I don't, I hang with them, but I'm not really like them. You know, I just, <laughs> I just be with them because they need help. No, I don't think that he cared much that he had the reputation. I can hear him saying, show you right. That's right, these mine, these my homies, these are the ones that I spend time with. I enjoy their company just like they enjoy mine. And since he didn't feel that people that society thought less of would diminish his situation and his authority and his hands and his feet and his heart were connected to human beings in a human situation. Jesus was walking around in the flesh, I wonder where would he be now? What kind of thing would he attack to, attach to? What kind of thing would this Palestinian Jew be doing right now in our time? I can see him sitting at tables with us working on the issues of human sexuality, working on the issues of substance abuse and homelessness. I can see Jesus saying, we got to do more than provide tents. Come on now. We've got to do something to help people help themselves. Come on, I can see Jesus talking about the issues of death, about gun violence and empire and access to health care and the prison industrial complex. I can see him dealing with us with our exceptionalism. Come on now. And those of us that feel like because we were bought or born into it that we have the opportunity to be in a higher place with God. God loves us. Manifest destiny. Anybody understand what I'm saying? God favors us somehow because we're us. I can see Jesus saying, get down off that high horse and go help somebody. I can see Jesus doing that. I can see that happening. I can see it. I can see him rolling up with a Black Lives Matter t-shirt on. I can see Jesus. That's in a pink hat at the same time. I can see Jesus doing that work. The issues and dealing with the issues of church folks in denial. Hear me today. Be the book. At Starbucks, be the book. At Walmart, at Super Walmart, be the book. On your job. Be the book on public transportation. Be the book everywhere you go, because you just never know. Be kind. Be generous with your compliments. Learn how to treat people like you want to be treated, because that is much more holy than quoting scripture. Be the book everywhere we go. What did it prophetically cost him to, be the, to show up and speak truth to power? He was so busy being it, you know, Jesus never wrote anything. Everything was written about him. He never wrote anything that we know of. But folks wrote about him because he was so busy being it. Come on, hear me. He was so busy being it. What did it cost him? It cost him everything. What will it cost us? It will cost us everything. But do it, cross the line, take the risk. Put yourself in harm's way. Go up in the attic and get your Birkenstocks and your signs down. Get in one of these marches again. Make some noise. Don't just leave it to other people. Get out there and be the book because the sick still need healers and the poor still need champions. And this time is in need of a living word because in many ways, organized church on the right has in so many ways abdicated its moral authority. And the question is, who will get in the gap, stand in the gap and make up the hedge? What I've learned is that you don't have to lay down with the devil in order to please God. And there are people that have laid down, I know, I know I got to quit, have laid down with evil in our time. And they have done it, they said, because this is what God wants. I said, no, test it out. 
God has never had to get in league with evil to do good. God knows how to do good because God is good. Hey, hallelujah. The God I serve is an awesome God. Hallelujah. Who can do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think. And I've got Pentecostals coming up, so let me sit down. God needs some champions, and the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. Yeah. Let me say it again. The Spirit of the Lord is upon you, and God has anointed you to bring good news to the poor, sight to the blind, set the captives free, and set the oppressed free, and speak truth to power, and do the work that you are called to do. Don't keep handing it off to someone else. But do what God has called you to do, sisters, brothers, siblings, in this time when so many have compromised the gospel to defend evil in order to keep their status, their money, their reputation, and their power. God needs some prophets, hallelujah, who will speak without fear and compromise the gospel message to defend us from evil, God is calling for some walking, talking, marching, fighting, sometimes cussing. <laughs> Books. Be the book. God bless. told me like three years ago that I would be where I am right now. Uh, why a young adult leader? I, I wouldn't have believed you at all. I was literally at the lowest of my lows, mental breakdown, I was done. I had given up on myself, basically. But I didn't want to give up, so I kept I was like, I gotta go to church, man, because I'm, I'm done doing it my way. And I remember praying and I said, God, if you get me out of this, this mess I'm in, I promise you for the rest of my days, it's you first. God, family, and then my career. I asked that God put the right people in my life and take the wrong ones away because I know that I wanna be different. I know that I don't want to do things the same anymore. That was it. It literally shifted from that point on. I finally knew my worth, and it was literally because of Cathedral of Hope. Like, I met the right people. I met people who genuinely loved me for me. I didn't have to hide who I was. I've done that, you know. So I, I just kept going. And I said, I'm going to put God first, I'm going to put God first. And everything that was, every opportunity that was presented to me, like even if it was just moving a chair at church, like if somebody asked me, can you help me? Can you do this? I would say yes, because that's what I was there for. I knew that I had wanted to volunteer. I wanted to give my time because I didn't have any money. I didn't have a job. So how, how was I going to give? It's been crazy. I can't tell you how much I've gone through. But everything that I've gone through in my life up until this point, I had to go through the good, the bad, the ugly, the highs, the lows, because I knew I was going to meet people. And I knew I was going to meet people that had to see me. Look at me, like, I'm the epitome of a rebel. And if I can do it, you can do it. 
there's not enough young adults at church. And it's because they literally have been told over and over and over again that you don't belong here. But you do. You are loved, you're welcomed, and you gotta just come. It only works if you work it, right? So that's what I want, is I want to be a voice. And so, people of God, we give because the Spirit of God has given us new life. I'm grateful for the story of Aureli. I'm grateful for the stories that Bishop Flunder, that Reverend Dr. Neal, that all of our folks in this community share. And people of God, I'm grateful for your story. When you share your story, other lives are transformed. The Word tells us to share good news. And when you share your story, you indeed are sharing good news. As you pass the red tablets that are in your pews today, we ask you to please sign in, update any contact info, and as well, share with us your prayer concerns so we may pray with you during the week. Also share with us any celebrations you're experiencing in your life. We would love to celebrate with you throughout the week. If you're here for the very first time, welcome to this space. Be loved and know you are a blessing. You're not expected to give of anything this morning. Just receive from the presence of God. And so as we begin to receive our tithes and our offerings, will you please pray with me? And so, Holy One, we are mindful. Mindful and we are gracious. God, we are mindful of the very presence that surrounds us, of the goodness of God that fills us. And God, we ask you to bless these tithes. We ask you to bless these offerings because, God, you have already blessed our lives. And so we speak abundant blessings upon these offerings. Transform us as you transform this world. In Jesus' name, amen.
Friends, we come to this table week in and week out as a reminder of what God has done for us, the sacrifice of a meal, a calling together of God's people at a table. But as we receive of this meal this day, we are reminded that this table is not a table that is fixed in time, but a table that has also evolved and moved through time. It is a table of liberation, a table of hospitality, and a table that has been opened not just to those who thought they were welcome, but to a table that includes every single one of us because we are in the book. But we are also beyond the book. And when Jesus took that bread from that table that day, he broke with some traditions. He broke bread. He gave it to them, and he said, you've been in the book too long. It's time to be the book. So take this bread, eat of it, and be the book. Live this brokenness in the broken world that it might find healing and wholeness and find that tilakun, that repairing of life. And in the same way, he took from the table a cup he gave you thanks, he blessed it, he broke it, he shared it with every single one of them and he said, get out of the book. Move beyond yourself, move beyond the traditions, move beyond what people have said you are and be me. Be me in the world. And this bread and this cup will give you life and life in abundance. So friends, we gather at this place this day, at this table, not just to receive, not just to remember, (laughs) but to become. May we be Jesus in the world today. Let us pray. Almighty God, send the power of your spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of grape and grain. Make them be for us holy food that nurtures us in body and spirit, that by sharing in this feast, we may know the presence of the living Christ. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Through Jesus Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory be yours, now and forever. Amen. Come expecting.
We thank you for this sacred meal of love. We have felt your spirit here this day. May she continue to work amongst us as we go out into this world to do your work and be your hands and feet for all to see that you are love. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. Jesus took the scroll, handed it back to the attendants, sat down, and all eyes were fixed on him. For the Spirit of the Sovereign God is upon you, you, to bring good news to the poor and to lift up the brokenhearted. As we go from this place, may we no longer just read the book. May we be the book. Amen. And so unto God's gracious mercy and protection, each and every one of us is given and the blessing of God known to us as Creator, Savior, and Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us now and evermore. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.